So tonight, it really is a rare, rare privilege on my part. I've had the benefit of not only uh, observing Rob, but uh, we've, we've had the opportunity to work together as co-investors in, in, a, in an angel group here in South Florida called New World Angels. And um, also as parents, our, our, our sons went to the same uh, elementary and I think middle school. And uh, it's remarkable. Sometimes you, you, you see somebody day in, day out, and you don't realize what's happening in front of your very eyes. But every it took a headline. Every time you see a headline, when it would talk about the, the companies that Rob was, was leading and growing, to re realize that's the same guy I just saw at a basketball game, or that's the guy I just uh, waved at in the parking lot. He doesn't look any different than me. And, but and it's just, you, it's, just a, it's been really a, 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 a great privilege to watch uh, Rob's progress and the companies that he's been involved in. So let's, uh, let's learn a little bit more about uh, what, what he's done and what he has to share with us tonight. So Rob Flippo is the chief executive officer presently of Mobile Help. During the past 16 years, he's worked in both startup environments and as well as in Fortune 50 companies. He has experience in forming high performance teams and he's held executive roles at high tech companies such as Motorola, Boca Research, and Emergent Incorporated. He is currently a member of the board of directors of the Medical Alert Monitoring Association with the really awesome acronym of MAMA. <laughs> so when you go to your meetings, I'm sure you, you say, come to MAMA. <laughs> In his most recent role as Vice President of Operations as Emergent, this is before he uh, came to Mobile Help, uh, he was responsible for all aspects of the company's operations, including the function of CFO and COO. So I don't want to hear any whining tonight from anybody about being chief cook and bottle washer, because Rob has done that. Uh, Rob joined Emergent as a Director of Engineering Operations in 2003, and he successfully scaled the company to, from $2.4 in revenue in that year to, to 15 plus million in 2007, just four years later. He raised 4 million in funding and then negotiated the exit and sale of the company uh, just, was it one year later? Yeah, one year later to Phillips, uh, in December to Phillips Electronics. He joined Emergence um, Mo from Motorola's wireless mes messaging division where he served as director of product and business development. At Motorola, he was responsible for managing Motorola's advanced mes messaging product lines, patent licenses, and contract negotiations. So kind of a rare example of a technologist who also was entrusted at a very high level with a lot of the business uh, aspects. So prior to joining Motorola, he served as director of engineering at Zoom Telephonics, which used to be called Boca Research, which was a leading modem and networking company. And his duties there included managing software development for efforts for real-time embedded operations. Uh, Rob has an MBA from University of Miami, a BS in electrical engineering from USF, which is University of South Florida, for those of you who don't know. And he completed coursework in business management at Harvard Business School. I knew I liked you. That is awesome. Way to go. Rob holds seven U.S. patents for communication systems. And uh, what this doesn't spell out, we'll, let, we'll hear directly from you, is the fact that uh, you're, I believe, the co-founder of, uh, of, of Mobile Help in that journey, which uh, really has just been an exceptional ride. So we have with us tonight a, uh, a true serial entrepreneur with two exits under his belt. Uh, so without further ado, Rob, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Reese. Thank you for the kind words. And our, our kids are still going to school together at UF. Right. The, uh, the, the Hurricane UF thing, I've, I've actually taken up the UF mantra. They're fun to watch football. Um, so become a, a, become a UF fan, although it is a bit of an internal conflict. I have that must say. be hard. You're a cane and a, and a, and a bull. What are they called? And bulls. The, well, yeah. in the USF, it's the bulls. And, and when I was at USF, which is tells you how old I am. They actually didn't have a football team. So <clears throat> there wasn't really much to follow in the way of sports. I think they had a really good soccer team and cross country team, but um, football wasn't part of the equation. Um, so it's been fun watching him, watching him do that. He's enjoying himself um, up at UF and I'm sure he's going to do, sure he's going to do great. Well, uh, from your lips to God's ears. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, all right. Well, so let's see. Let's, let's just jump into it. Um, yeah. So before we actually jump into mobile help, perhaps you can tell us a bit about kind of what led up to your involvement with mobile help. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I, and I'm going to go back a little way. So yeah. um, I, I like to tell a story because when I was 10 years old, I took the lawnmower from our garage and I started mowing, mowing the neighbor's lawns and didn't know at the time that I was actually being an entrepreneur. I just wanted to make some extra money. Um, and started off a uh, pretty simple idea, take my dad's lawnmower and go mow people's lawns. Um, had a really good return on investment because I didn't pay for the lawnmower. 
And he still to this day reminds me that I didn't pay for the gas either. So I had like 100% return on investment for my time for, uh, for mowing people's lawns. But um, I did, I did um, grow up from there and I did go to University of South Florida. Um, wanted to be an engineer really because I was good at math and science and I thought that was a, a pretty easy career path. So I did that. I got my electrical engineering degree from the University of South Florida. And when I graduated, I went to work for Harris Corporation. I was actually working on a master's in electrical engineering when I went. So I went as an intern and never really stopped. Like I actually stayed at, at Harris Corporation. Was that in Melbourne? In Melbourne, Florida, yep. Yeah. So okay. I just went across the state and uh, worked on really, really high-end government communication systems. Engineering-wise, the funnest work I've ever done. Even now, I still can't talk about it, but it was really, really fun and interesting work. Um, but as the political landscape changed and the Republicans got voted out of the uh, presidential office, the funding for companies like Harris tends to modulate depending on who's in, who's in office. So things started to, to decline a little bit there. And I ended up um, fortunately being able to go to Motorola in South Florida. So spent a few years at Harris and then I went down to, uh, to Motorola in uh, plantation. So I was working in the, uh, um, advanced messaging group there. We were actually making um, microcellular deck phones before they were a thing. Um, and right after I got to, uh, to Motorola, they started a program that let um, engineers go or, or people at, at Motorola go get their MBAs from University of Miami. So they set up a program um, with 24 of us and they basically sent us off to get our MBAs. It was a little bit of a strange program because it was every weekend for two years straight. So it was all day Saturday from eight in the morning till four o'clock in the evening um, for two years straight, no summers off. So football, football weekends included? All weekends. We were, in, we were in school every single weekend. During football games? During football games. So, That's serious. Um, but it was great because all I had to pay for was books. So it was a, it was a pretty, good, uh, pretty good deal for me. Um, so I went to Motorola as a, essentially an, a lead engineer. So very much on the technical track and doing technical things, but it started to move into more management kind of roles, managing small groups of people. And then after I got my MBA from the, uh, from, from University of Miami, it really exposed me and opened up, opened up my eyes to this whole other world of the business that was going on behind the engineering components. So at Motorola, there were thousands of engineers working on great and innovative products, but in that role, you never got to see what it really meant. Like, what, it, what, what does this mean in terms of business? And the, the MBA really kind of opened my eyes to that and really intrigued me about sort of the operations of the business. So from there, I quickly started getting into much higher level um, management. And one of the things I realized was that in a company that big, from a business impact, you have virtually no impact. Like you're, you're one of 60 or 80,000 employees, and there's really little that you can do to have a material impact on the business. Rob, and, yeah. here's, an, here's an important point where I need to interrupt you and, and uh, tell everybody that FAU has a phenomenal MBA program. And even though you went to University of Miami, <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Oh, I, I know I know a number of people who've gotten their MBAs from from FAU and they've gone on to do really great things. So that was an awesome that was an awesome infomercial for U of M's business uh, MBA program. Though, I have to say that was pretty good. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. So I um, I actually started to get a little bit depressed in my role. I had a good job and doing well, but I just really didn't feel like I had much impact on the business. So. Um, I think my wife was starting to notice that I just wasn't enjoying work anymore. And she, she sees this ad in the newspaper, which was the way people used to get jobs or find jobs, for director of engineering at a local um, Boca firm right around the corner from our house called Boca Research. It's over on Clintmore, or it was on Clintmore. Um, and she's like, why don't you apply for this job? And I thought, well, okay, let me do that. And and I did, and I was kind of young, so I was in my 20s, and I was going to go apply for this director of engineering job, and um, I actually got the job, 
um, and was sort of thrown into the fire. So Boca Research wasn't a startup, but they also weren't anything like Motorola or Harris. It, it was a couple hundred people. And at the time they were manufacturing modems right in, in the middle of Boca Raton, which nobody even knows that was a thing. This was prior to the, um, the um, commoditization of, of modems. So there was a four line factory right over there on Clintmore Road that was building modems. And they were trying to get into the set-top box business. So we were working on something called AOL TV. And since nobody's ever heard of that, you can see how far that went. But um, as, a, as a fairly young manager, I was kind of thrown into the fire. So I was used to really big structure and lots of support. And now I've got 24 engineers working for me. Most of them were older than me. So that um, was an interesting dynamic for sure. Because at least two of them thought they should have gotten the job that I was offered. Um, but I learned a lot and I learned you could wear a lot of hats um, and you need to wear a lot of hats when the company has only a couple hundred people. Um, but in that role, I really had an impact. So if we had a product that needed to be released and it didn't get released, it had a material impact on the financials of the business because it wasn't just one of a hundred other things that were going on and, and sort of hidden. Um, your, your impact was, was notable and um, it was the hardest or one of the hardest times I ever had to work up till that point, but I was happy. Like I was really relishing the fact that what I'm doing here makes a difference. Um, I had some stock options as part of my deal. So I got a little bit of taste of what that means in terms of value creation for myself personally um, and, and had a really good time. It was a great learning experience. As modems became more commoditized, that business started to decline. And I did go back to Motorola for three or four years. One of my former bosses, who is an FAU alum, who's done extremely well um, at Motorola, hired me back to, to, um, to run some programs and ultimately got into patent licensing there. But I got back into the same mode where it was like, I just didn't feel like I had an impact, so. Who was that, by the way? Can you share the, the name of the person? Yeah, it was Karen Dunning. Okay. So, I don't know if you know her. She's sort of, she moved up the, she's definitely moved up the corporate ladder at Motorola. I think she's in charge of HR now, which is interesting wow. because her background is marketing, but. I had another question for you. Who was the CEO at Boca Research when you were there? Tony Zielinski? Yeah, I knew Tony. Yeah. yeah he, uh, so he died fairly young, didn't he? He did. Yeah. He um, unfortunately did. But um, again, okay. great, great experience. I went back to Motorola. Um, I was in contact with the, with, I was working at a group in Motorola that was kind of like a startup group within the bigger corporation for a while. Um, and got to know a guy named Michael McNeil, who was, who was a contractor for Motorola for a product called, um, Air Apparent. So the, this product basically connected messaging devices to text and cell phones. And so if you had a system that needed to be monitored and it had an alarm or alert going on, this their apparent system would take the alerts and propagate them to a pager or a cell phone. Motorola decided to get out of that business and they had no idea what to do with it. So Michael, who was a contractor, a software contractor who had written a lot of it and his company had written a lot of it, said, hey, I'll take that over for you. And um, um, ended up getting the rights to that software from Motorola in exchange for taking over the business for them. It was a fairly small business. Um, he went out and raised money from the Silicon Beach venture capital Cinetech days. Um, and I think he maybe raised a million dollars and was gonna kind of build, build it up. Um, and it kind of went sideways for a few years. And at some point he's like, hey, why don't you come help me work on this thing? Was we, this emergent? This was emergent. Okay. Um, so I was like, yeah, that's interesting. And got kind of excited about it. There were only about 12 people at the company at the time. It was again, kind of going sideways and trying to find its way. Um, so I Can ended up having a quick, good, so go ahead. Forgive me, just a quick editorial note. Uh, our first speaker of this year two year two session two months ago was Scott Adams. Scott Adams, uh, took his first money from his first exit and started in a tech incubator back in the year 99, 1999, 2000. And uh, the, I think he seeded or did about 12 companies or so. 
and Emergent, which is the company Rob's talking about right now, is one of them, and really the only one that succeeded out of that that uh, portfolio. So, uh, so just to show you some yeah, yeah. context. Anyway, yeah, it's a small world, and that's actually when I got to know Scott, and we're we're actually good friends now. But so here's the so here's the scenario. I'm working for Motorola, have a pretty cushy corporate job doing patent licensing, and um, honestly, not working all that hard, but again, wasn't, wasn't all that happy in that role. And I was almost, I was also afraid they were going to move me up to Schaumburg, which is outside of Chicago, which made me wake up in cold sweats every now and then. But, um, so the, the option was keep doing this cushy job or go work for a totally startup the, the board called it a restart because it was kind of in flux and, and moving sideways. And to do that, I was going to have to take a huge pay cut, right? It was 30% pay cut to go do this. Um, but I was going to get some equity in the company and some options. And you can imagine how that conversation went with my wife. Like, here's the, here's what I'm thinking about doing. And she's like, are you completely out of your mind? Like this, you, you gotta be kidding me. And to top it all off, Scott, who was the chairman at the time, I believe, um, made a requirement that whoever took over this role in operations at Emergen needed to have some skin in the game. So to take the job, I had to pay money to buy stock in the company. Stock that was frankly worthless when I bought it, but he wanted to make sure whoever went in that role really believed in what they were doing and that they were gonna take the company somewhere. And uh, so that added to the conversation with my wife, Alice, and like, okay, not only am I going to take a pay cut, I got to actually pay money to go work for this place. But I believe what they had could, could go somewhere, that we could take it and, and do something with it. Um, I'm not exactly sure how I convinced her to, to do it, um, but, I, but I did. And, and it ultimately worked out, worked out well. Um, but it was, a, it was definitely an interesting transition. So now I'm in a 10 person company doing at the time, not even a couple of million of revenue, trying to figure out how we're going to grow this and what, we're, what are we going to do with it? Um, and by taking on the sort of operational roles, it allowed Michael who really had done, he was an engineer too, but he really dug into the sort of sales and marketing and how he was going to sort of craft this architecture story. He went and did that while I was doing all the operation stuff. And we were really successful. So we were able to grow that business very quickly over the course of three years. And we ultimately got um, two really big competitors in the healthcare space bidding, bidding against each other for that asset because it was becoming a really important part of their, of their um, solution. So that was Philips and who else? Uh, GE Medical. So you had Philips and GE Medical in an auction to try to purchase your company. We did, and it wasn't even planned. Like GE came talking to us, and then we kind of went through a bunch of negotiations. There was no formal process. We didn't hire a bank. It just kind of happened, which is very unusual, by the way. It doesn't doesn't yeah. normally happen that way. But at some point along the way, Phillips found out about it, and they got really nervous because we were actually much more embedded with Phillips at the time. And they came in and did something very preemptive guaranteed a really quick close. And from the time we negotiated the price, it took 90 days and, and we were the, we were then owned by Phillips. Well, that was, 80, was that an $85 million transaction or 90? What was it? It was in the, it was in the 70 million range. 70 million. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, not too so, shabby. <laughs> yeah. Not too shabby at all. So um, being a Dutch company to move that quickly, it just showed how sort of interested and, and strategic it was for them. And, that, and the remnants of that company still remain in Boca Raton. There's still some engineers that, that work in Boca for, for Philips on that product. Um, How many financing rounds did you have prior to the exit? So there was really the original Cinetech financing. Um, and then we raised money from Johnson Controls as a strategic investment along the way. And that was really the only other financial raise we did. Um, wow. And there was no, we didn't have debt. So it was, it was kind of a, when I got there, it was just barely sort of cash, cash flow break even. And we were constantly sort of just in time building the team as we needed it to kind of stay right at cash flow even, hmm. cash flow neutral. And even by the time we sold it, it was cash flow neutral. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, 
wildly cash flowing at the time, but very strategic to the to the buyer, obviously. Um, so now we're sort of at the end of 2007. We sold the company to Phillips. Um, I was an employee at Phillips for about a week before I realized that wasn't going to work because even within a week, I could feel the sort of corporate bureaucracy like it kicked in immediately because there were corporate people who wanted to sort of take over control, not even control, but just um, credit for everything that was going on. And um, I was luckily to quickly be able to, to sort of fully exit that, that scenario. Um, and I found myself sort of looking for what the next thing to do was. And to your point about networks at the time, Scott and I had gotten to know each other really well. And of the five, five or six things that I was looking at maybe going to do next, he's, he's like, Hey Rob, what do you think about this business plan? And it was um, a business plan for Alzheimer's tracking device and pet tracking um, that, that Elias Genetis had put together and was circulating in the community. And he said, what do you think about this? I've always wanted to get into a tracking company. Um, can you take a look at it and really just kind of do due diligence for me for what, for whether you think it's a good opportunity. And one of the, one of the components of the business plan talked about um, medical alarms because Elias had been in the medical alarm business for a few years and always said that people were frustrated that they didn't work outside of your home. And if, what if you could just have a cellular version that worked outside of your home and get you sort of personal on-star safety outside of your home? And I was really intrigued by that because having a communications background, I thought, you know, there's no technical reason why you can't do this. This isn't even rocket science, right? It's pretty basic application of technology. And I thought for sure there was some tariff or cellular or there had to be some reason that nobody had done this. It just makes no sense that nobody had done this. And You're talking basically I fall and I can't get up, but doing it outside the home or wherever you are. Yeah, exactly. Got it. it again, using cellular and GPS, right? It wasn't, wasn't crazy leap of technology. And after about three weeks of digging around, I realized nobody's ever done this before. And it just <laughs> didn't make any sense to me at all. So I went back to Scott and said, hey, this, this looks like it could re be really interesting. So um, I decided to come on board. Um, Scott was one of the first real um, investors in the company. And we really built it from, from that idea and a really basic uh, prototype to what it is today with over 300,000 active customers and 240 employees. Mm -hmm. But um, it was, it was that, that's really how, how the so, sort of the mobile help part of the adventure started. And I, I could tell you another 40 minutes of, <laughs> of that because it's been 12 years now. It wasn't even a, let's just go disrupt the world and, and sell the company. It's been, it's been quite a journey. Excellent. Well, let me throw a couple questions at you, and, and it might might be interesting to uh, integrate in some comments on Mobile Help's uh, uh, journey, as well as your own. <laughs> so, um, what uh, I guess is, you know, we talked about some successes here, but we know that uh, uh, a good part of being an entrepreneur is is uh, dealing with many failures and many near death experiences. And uh, it's interesting to think that you've been through one successful journey and exit, and then you, you know, a second one too. But w were there any uh, aspects uh, of any threats, risks, or crises that you just did not see coming, not in a thousand years, or nothing you could have kind of predicted that you'd have to deal with? Yeah, I think, especially on the mobile help side, the one thing that I really didn't um, appreciate was the challenge we were going to have raising money. So this is 2008 when the entire financial world was on fire and venture capital wasn't even, wasn't even funding companies unless you were profitable, which is completely out of the norm for, for venture capital. That's called banking. They were basically paying exactly. banks. Yeah. yeah. So VCs became banks and banks stopped lending to anybody. And and angels became VCs. It was great time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, the, the fundraising was incredibly challenging. We were lucky enough to have early on support from some pretty successful entrepreneurs in the local area who had their own networks of, of individuals. So we never raised money from um, financial institutions up until we were able to get bank financing. So it was all 
high net worth individuals who really sort of appreciated the idea of a recurring revenue model, which will resonate with any potential investor, regardless of what the circumstances for the recurring revenue are. Um, and a lot of them just really love the simplicity. Like I, I remember one of our investors, it was a guy who worked for Noble Financial, his comment after we kind of gave the pitch, he's like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of in my life. And he didn't mean it in a bad way. It was just like, <laughs> how come nobody's figured this out? Like this is such a, such a no brainer. Um, and we just happened to get into a, a, an industry that was very stagnant, um, had no innovation for like 35 plus years. And we were able to convince um, primarily high net worth individuals that it was worth taking a risk. I mean, this is at the time when people didn't even know if their bank account was solvent, right? Whether, you're, yeah. whether your savings account was safe. And yeah. we're out walking around with a balsa wood model of, of, of a device like this, trying to convince people to, to invest money in a, a real startup. Um, and it was really challenging because it wasn't like go raise $3 million and then you got runway for two years. It was, we were raising just enough money to get to the next milestone and to the next set of revenue. And if you didn't make progress at each one of those phases, we would have never been able to raise money. But luckily we were able to make progress we were able to generate revenue quickly and grow that revenue. So every time we went back for, for capital, we had real progress to show and real growth <clears throat> and a real plan to towards keeping it going. Uh, I, we always stress with the entrepreneurs when they do their kind of their pitch documents and mentally as a construct, they think of timeline and budget and milestone, timeline, budget and milestones. Is that what your experience was when you were staging these financings and is that how the conversation was framed with the investors? Yeah, absolutely. Like, what are you going to use my money for? Because I worked really hard for it. How, how are you going to use it? When are you going to use it? When am I going to see a return on that? Was sort of the, the lens that, that these investors were viewing it through. Um, and you had to spend the money, and I do this anyways, like it's yours, like it was your last, like it was your last dime. Mm -hmm. And because of, the, because of the way we were, we were raising funds, we ran out of money like six times along the way. Like literally, if we hadn't made the next investment, we were, we were out of, we were out of run, completely out of runway, which so, creates a lot of stress. And, I was going to ask you for how many weeks or months did that feeling of like, oh my God, this we we might run out of money completely. Um, two and a half years. Yeah, it was it was constant of we were going to I mean, and I was lucky enough at the very beginning to not need to be paid. So that was sort of part of the deal that I would I had done enough in the in the previous role to have that leeway. And so I wasn't a, a burden on the business for at least a period of time, um, which is really helpful. Like investors don't want to see all their money going into the founder's salary. Right there. <laughs> that's frankly the last thing they want to see, see especially early in the process right you they want to they want to see the money going to generating the next customer or building the next thing that you're supposed to be building got it excellent well so kind of a two-part question here uh, i don't think we've had the opportunity to hear about mobile helps exit ultimately how that happened who acquired you uh and then uh, relatedly what what part of mobile help success would you say you're most proud of okay yeah, so the, on the first part um, that, about the timing, so we, we started raising money in the 2008 timeframe. Fast forward to 2017, um, there were a lot of investors who weren't planning on being owners of a medical alarm company for the rest of their lives. So we were showing great success, continuing to move the ball forward. We had about 45 investors at the time. And it really was just a, hey, we're ready to see a return on our, on our investment um, that really drove us to run a formal sale process with uh, Raymond James. They, they, they ran the process. It was a pretty broad process focused on um, private equity as well as strategics. And the ultimate outcome of that was that a private equity firm called Avery Partners out of Boston prevailed. Um, and took ownership of the company in 2017. Um, and the investors were happy with their returns for sure. Uh -huh. That was in uh, what, that would that be called eight figures? 
nine figures. It was, uh, this is nine figures. Nine figures. Yeah. Doesn't happen every day. Yeah, it was a, it was a pretty fun day for sure. The, the process getting to there was not very fun and had a lot of bumps. The, the actual negotiation process and getting, getting it across the finish line, I didn't think we were ever going to get done. But uh, How long did, did that process take? It took about four months. A four-month close or negotiation and close? Yeah, from the time we started the process to the time we closed was about four months. Uh -huh. Now, this case, you did have an investment banker advising you, Raymond James, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what would you say uh, one of the things you're most proud of uh, in terms of building mobile help? Yeah, so there's, there's a couple of things that I'm most proud of the fact that every single day we're saving lives. So I get reports about how many dispatches we do on a daily basis to, to people like our parents and grandparents who, who need help uh, from time to time. And that just makes me feel good that we've been able to take some technology, make it really work for people, and frankly, save lives every single day. Um, the other thing that I'm really proud of is the culture we've built. So the culture within Mobile Help, our, our internal vision is to be someone's hero every day. And we really live by that. So we're heroes to people who we save, who we, who we may save their, save their lives. But that feeling of um, trying to really help people is a big part of the culture that we've built. And, and I think it's a big part of why we're successful. Uh, I heard a speaker say the other day something that I thought was brilliant. He said that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast every day of the week. I, I wouldn't argue with that for sure. I think, I think if you set the right culture and you set it from the top and you live by it, people can do amazing things. And amazing things can, can, can happen. I remember uh, similarly when Dan Kane had raised at, at Mobile at uh, Modernizing Medicine, he had raised a significant amount of capital from a private equity firm. And we asked him, how has his job changed? And he said, I spend so much of my time just keeping company, preserving company culture, going between and among the units and making sure everybody's on the same page and everybody's committed to the same vision. And uh, that that was news to me. You th I think of a CEO, CEO as spending all their time raising money or going over strategy. But he said, no, he's literally spending a lot of time with each unit, each unit leader and teams. So anyway, I, I, I believe that. And I, and I think that one of the challenges is as the company gets bigger, it gets harder and harder, right? So it has to, the, you have to scream it louder from the mountaintop to make sure that it gets down to everybody. So everybody's on the same page. And when you give those mes messages to stay on culture and keeping the same shared vision, um, that's a that's kind of a broad platitude, but where is it specific? Is it, are you talking like what what type of applying that? What what are the messages that you're pounding the table on? Is yeah, it is it revenue? Is it customers? Is it timeline? What is it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a commitment to our customers as kind of drives everything else, right? So if you're if you're committed to keeping customers happy, revenue happens. Um, the the timelines for getting things done are important. Um, in order to in order to meet those customers' needs, so it, it all sort of starts with 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 again being a hero to every customer. Got it. Excellent. Well, uh, where do you what do you think the future of the sector that you're in uh, will look like, and how do you prepare for it? Yeah, I think it's evolving. So the help I fall and I can't get up medical alarm business is is going to be around for a while, right? I think. I think the form factors are going to change. You and I aren't going to carry a separate device someday when we're old enough to need the service. We're but I will fall down. You will, and it, but you'll expect your cell phone to, to be the communication portal for that, right? You're not going to carry an individual device. But that doesn't mean you don't need trained operators who are, who are able to sort of know who you are, where you're at, and dispatch help to your exact location. So the professional monitoring and the service becomes becomes the product versus a, a widget that you're that, that you're selling the other thing is that we're seeing an evolution in um, home healthcare monitoring so not just reactive press a button because something happened but monitor my blood pressure my weight and my blood glucose on a continuous basis so that my doctor, can intervene if things are going wrong. And rather than going once every six months to the doctor and getting these data points in time, having a continuous flow of that data 
um, is going to be really important to keep people safe and healthy and sort of aging in place. And we are spending a lot of time and energy and investments to be part of that ecosystem because we think it's a natural evolution of sort of the home safety to um, home healthiness. On that point of evolution, you hit upon something that's really important. And I know uh, in years past, it's been a, a, I think one of the, when I think of you, Rob, I, I think of kind of one of your key messages. There's that whole saying that hardware is hard and software is, is somewhat easier. And you're a guy that tackles both simultaneously, uh, trying to use a hardware product where you have to get that right, the form factors and every piece of it, not to mention manufacturing distribution. But then you got the software that is every bit as important and doing them both simultaneously is an absolute freaking nightmare. But now you're talking about becoming a, what sounds like a data company, continuous monitoring, the device goes away perhaps, but you're really talking about a service and it's all about data. How do you get your head around that, 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 uh, that transition? How do, you, how do you do that? Well, the, the good news is that I never wanted to be in the hardware business to begin with. I had enough, <laughs> I had enough experience at Motorola to know that's just not a fun, not a fun business. We did it out of necessity because there weren't any devices that we could pick up off the shelf that would deliver what we needed them to deliver. Um, so I'm anxious over time to get out of the hardware business when we can, but it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a lot of time. Um, because I had a hardware background, the hardware was, was not as challenging just because it was sort of core, sort of, core to my, my capabilities. Um, but as we move to becoming more of a SaaS-based um, service delivery company, software is actually becoming more important. So in the very early days, the, the, the device needed to do what it needed to do. It needed to be the right form factor, et cetera. But all of these new um, areas that we're going in have a lot more to do with data, data analytics, passing data from one system to another seamlessly. Um, and a lot of this stuff is under the FDA umbrella. So it has a lot of regulatory components on top of it and quality components on top of it. But software is going to, the company over time will become much more of a software company. Hmm. And, and, and thinking about software and, and uh, data, as you mentioned, it, or I'm sorry, software and, and, and the service of it. I haven't heard you talk as much about data or about mining the data or about AI or intelligence. Is yeah, that for someone else? No, that, that's, that's, that's sort of always going on in the background. So the system that we built, and, and I give our, our architect, a um, guy named Jean Robichaud, our CTO, a lot of credit for designing our system from the very beginning to be highly scalable because that was what his background was. All of it was originally built on AWS, still on AWS with multi-site redundancy, but all the data has to flow through our system. It's designed so that we sort of control and aggregate all the data. So we're sort of the keepers of all that data. And over time, we know that there will be a tremendous amount of value in that data because we can sort of correlate age to anything from did you fall down a lot to is your blood pressure rising? Um, there's just so much that we'll be able to do with that data in the long run. And is, is it part of your business model to monetize it, to sell it, to uh, repurpose it, to maybe depersonalize or uh, strip out the, to identify it, but then to sell the, the broad data sets? In, in a broad sense, yes. Like there's no specific um, sort of business component to what that's worth. We just know that it's valuable uh -huh. and we're doing a good job of sort of maintaining it and making sure it's available when that time comes. Okay. And it'll probably, to your, to your point, it'll probably be on somebody else's radar some, somewhere down the road when Avery sells the company to somebody else. Yeah. I, I only mention it because, again, modernizing medicine comes to mind. Originally, they were, you know, kind of a, a healthcare management platform, and then they clearly became data, and then they were giving away devices, but it's really all about what they're doing with the data and uh, mining that and licensing it and all that. It's really fascinating. <laughs> Um, well, we are, we're winding down to the actual top part. So before I ask you the last structured question, uh, let's encourage our audience to please, in the uh, Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, please uh, enter your questions for, for Rob, and we'll have about 10, 10 minutes for that uh, before we take our break, say goodbye to our audience, and then we'll reconvene with the companies, with the entrepreneurs. So um, what, uh, what, what advice, well, let's see, we'll, we'll save that for later, but... Uh, 
uh, so, you know, with, with, with again, two, you know, you kind of rare, rare accomplishment in life with two successful companies under your belt. You still have an awesome personality, hasn't gone to your head. But uh, what do you see as the next phase, next phase in your career? Yeah, my career, I mean, I think at, at some point, the private equity firm that bought mobile help is going to want to sell it. Um, and there will be some transition for me at, at some point down the road. I would actually like to teach. So I, I would love to teach an entrepreneurship class with a little bit different angle than a lot of, than a lot of classes. So I have a lot of friends who do what I do in terms of being serial entrepreneurs. I've had a lot of bumps and bruises along the way. And I'd really like to develop a class that I wish I could have had when I was in my twenties that really points out sort of, here's the, here's the 20 pitfalls to avoid that I, the mistakes I made and the mistakes friends of mine made that if I knew these, I might not have not, might not have done them. Um, and I think it could be a really fun class. And I think there's a lot of material because every single successful entrepreneur that I know, has had multiple failures and some of them really big, like not just little things have gone wrong, big things have gone wrong. But the key is that you learn from every one of them and you work really hard not to make the mistake again. There's no guarantee because humans are humans, but you'd like to think that as you learn about those mistakes, you're less likely to make them. And I want to, I want to build a structured class around that. That's interesting. You're teaching uh, what not to do in, in addition to teaching what to do. <laughs> yeah, I think all the books focus on sort of the right way to do stuff. I want to sort of point out, here's all the, here's all the things you might want to avoid. Uh, would you share just one, one of those negative lessons or anti-lessons with, with the group to, right now? Yeah, I think, the, I think one of the things, and you hear this all the time, is keep it simple, right? And it's really easy, especially in the early days of a startup, to sort of pivot around and shift your concept. And you need to do some of that, right? Because nobody ever builds a business plan that's exactly right. Like you, you'll have a general idea of where you're trying to go. But unless, you're, unless you've got a crystal ball, there's no way to know for certain which direction you need to go. So you need to have enough enough ability to shift and, and sort of modulate what you're doing without getting distracted. It is so easy to say, oh, we could do this and we could do that and we could do the other thing. And the next thing you know, you're spending all your cycles heading down rabbit holes without enough focus on, on at least one of those things to, to be successful. And I'm, I'm as guilty of that as anybody and, and really have to remind myself even today, like I'll get, hey, there's this great adjacent thing that we could go after, remind myself where our real direction is and make sure we maintain focus on it and keep things really simple. Hmm. Excellent. That's, uh, yeah, uh, the, we, it's funny. At the earliest stage when companies are at, uh, at, at the concept stage or still building a prototype, we, we massively encourage them to pivot and to be nimble. But I can see where that presents a lot of problems where you say when you're already much further along, you, you, can't, you can't constantly pivot. You can't continually add product features. You can't chase every uh, new amazing technology. Well, and that's, and that's why it's hard because you have to be nimble and you have to pivot, especially early. Yeah. But you have to, there has to be a limit to it also. Okay, great. Well, so we have two questions so far. Keep them coming, please, uh, uh, entrepreneurs and, and audience. But first one's from Victor of uh, Airlofts. Uh, Victor, very talented young entrepreneur. So Victor says that uh, our, Rob is talking about integrations. So how many systems are you looking to integrate with? And do you see making mobile help uh, a sort of data highway that would provide the seamless exchange for the information? Yeah, so on the, on the healthcare side, which is where the primary focus for those integrations are, there's a number of um, EMR platforms that we need to integrate with so that the data could be propagated directly to them. There are so many of them though that you have to be careful. It, it's hard to do every, every single integration. And luckily there are some companies that specialize in sort of building those integration bridges to, to especially EMR, EMR vendors. Um, and we will probably do integrations directly where we're doing something sort of special um, and then have a standard integration with one of those integration partners for the bulk of the, of the EMR systems to really be able to scale quickly. 
because it's the sort of data collection and transmission part of the system that we're experts on. So sort of from device to the data needing to get to the appropriate source is where our real expertise is. And from there to the EMR or clinical dashboard or whatever, um, we may do some of those direct and then we'll work with partners to, to get the bulk of those done. Great. Great. Well, Victor, if you have a follow-up question uh, in our second hour, you, know, you may have that opportunity. Uh, so Dan Volker, uh, who's uh, putting, really working on a really, really neat, potentially a revolutionary technology in the marine propulsion space, he has a question uh, kind of on the financing side uh, related to culture. It has to do with uh, uh, dilution and how to sell dilution to prior owners, prior investors when it's required. So his specific question is for a small company that needs funding, maybe with fewer than say a dozen owners, is there a way to go about convincing the 5% owners that it would, it's in their best interest or makes sense to be diluted significantly, even so that even if they become two and a half percent owners, but that that would be in the best interest of the company to be able to raise capital and move forward. How do you, uh, how do you go at that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the, the general answer is that a, a small piece of a much bigger pie is still a big piece. Um, but the reality is it's really challenging, right? And now you're getting into a situation where personalities get involved and people sort of project their own feelings on how things should be done and, and what should be done. And there's no simple answer to it. I think you have to convince people that at the end of the day, they're still going to be better off than, than not having been diluted. In the early phases, if the, if the option is we're going to run out of money and you're going to lose all your money, it's a lot easier than, um, than in, in other circumstances, but there's, it, it's, it's just hard no matter, no matter how you slice it. Um, he had asked kind of a related question. Can, uh, can that, the lesson about culture be more important than strategy? Is there, is there anywhere, any aspect within that truth he asked to kind of help sell it? But uh, it, oh, for wonder, the, on the dilution side? Yeah. Maybe if they're employees, right? Maybe. And I think as a, as the, as a founder, they're going to want to come and take the skin out of your hide, right? The, that's, <laughs> that's the first place they're going to come looking for not getting diluted. Um, but it, but it's always, it's always hard. Fair enough. Uh, time for one more question before we take our break. Uh, and this is from Dixon Lambois. Uh, Dixon and his partner Kennedy are really working on a very exciting uh, technology, uh, it's, it's an application, it's a, I think it's cloud-based, but they're looking at uh, optimizing supply chains for uh, small mid-sized companies. And it's really kind of neat what they're, the approach they're taking. So he's looking for, I think, another pearl of wisdom uh, for startup entrepreneurs uh, in order to be preparing for the exit in the future. So kind of a general, uh, maybe one of your, your pearls of wisdom and what they can yeah. be doing now to prepare for an exit. Yeah, so the, the best thing you can do is make sure your, re your records are in really good order. So in the early days, it's really easy to neglect sort of accounting records and legal records and um, things like that that are going to be really important on an exit because buyers don't want a lot of liability and they want to be able to be able to trust whatever data that you're providing. So it's going to be more work when you feel like you don't have time to do it, but you have to make sure that kind of thing is in order if there's trademarks that you need to register or um, um, making sure you have all the proper licensing. And again, as simple as accounting, make sure your accounting books are, are they don't necessarily need to be audited per se, but they need to be in good, clean order so that when somebody looks at it, they have confidence that you've been running the business um, efficiently. And that even, and you might have the greatest business, but if it doesn't read well on paper or have the right um, sort of documentation to back it up, it can really work against you. Yeah. And, there's not gonna, and there's not going to be enough time to do it. I can tell you that right now, but you, you just have to force yourself to do it. Four months is it? Four months isn't enough time, huh? <laughs> Well, and the, and the better organized all of that is, the smoother that process goes. Because if it's if it's not if it's not clean and something is found along the way, questions lead to more questions, lead to more questions, and then they lead to uncertainty about the accuracy of everything. So, does it also affect the valuation you might get? Oh yeah, yeah. If those numbers are wrong and they can't be trusted, 
you're going to get a discount or, or you're not going to get a deal done. We, uh, we have one more question from Silke. Donald Silke was an entrepreneur in our last class who's doing some really neat things in, uh, in the whole area of AI and uh, related to medical research. And so she asks uh, whether your system aggregating, uh, whether is your system aggregating patient data with data from medical literature so that doctors could be alerted to unexpected side effects or say unintended beneficial effects of a medication, which they could then do additional research on. The, no, our system is not, it wasn't really designed for that, but. That's what your system like, does, Silky. <laughs> I, like I like the idea though. That's a, that's a really <laughs> great, that's a really great idea. Okay, well maybe, maybe Silky can reach out to you. Uh, but. Uh, That'd be great. Yeah. All right, well, thank you, Rob. Uh, on behalf of the audience members who are not our entrepreneurs who will be leaving us uh, now, we, I, I wanna thank, thank you very much for, for all your insights and your time.